So with that, today is Transfiguration Sunday. It's the last thing before we head into Lent. And uh, I found a prayer that was written by Reverend Carla. If you've ever seen her stuff, she writes beautiful liturgy on her website. Uh, But let's pray together. Holy One, we come before you, many of us feeling like we have climbed just a part of the mountain, and there's so much more of a climb left to even get to point to dream that we might be dazzled by what is divine. Our loads are heavy with worry, with regret, with fatigue, with illness, with despair for all in the world, everyone that is hurting, in danger, in bondage, and more. We trudge ahead following you, stumbling, hoping, praying, breathing hard, hearts pounding, and yes, even some of us are nimble and skipping. Lead us, Lord, to the top of that mountain where we might be dazzled by your light, lifted by what is divine, filled by the sheer delight of what is numinous and ethereal and grounded and real. We pray this for ourselves, for one another, and for the worlds in which we live in. Transfiguration Sunday. Guess what we're reading about today? The Transfiguration. We're going to read it from the Gospel of Mark today. Mark's version of the Transfiguration. They're all slightly different. Uh, But this is found in Mark chapter 9, verses 2 through 9. Listen now for a word from the Lord. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice, This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. A word from God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. God, as I uh, preach this sermon that I wrote, I feel a little strange because I always feel strange trying to say something about you that's worth listening to or that is worth saying, and yet that's kind of my job. And so I've written this sermon. I'm going to preach it. I pray that you would do a supernatural work, that truth might go out, even though my, my lips are unclean, that they might go out into our hearts and into our minds, and we might take it and receive it and hear a word from you this morning in and through this sermon. In Jesus' name, amen. So you guys heard of Plato? You ever heard of the philosopher Plato? About 400 years before Jesus, Greek philosopher. We talk about platonic relationships. That comes from Plato. Uh, Plato was this philosopher. Uh, he, wasn't, he wasn't a religious figure. He was a philosopher. And he came up with theories, and he would tell stories much like Jesus did, would tell parables. He would tell stories to try to get his point across. And one of his most famous stories was called the theory of forms. And this is how it went. I think we have a picture. We have a picture legend. There we go. So Plato said, imagine that there is a guy who lives in a cave and has grown up in that cave. He has been sitting by this wall, chained to this wall his entire life. And somebody behind him has a a fire, a flame, and he holds up various objects in front of the flame so that it produces a shadow on the wall. Now this guy's entire life has been spent in front of this wall looking at these shadow objects. It's all that he knows. It's the only thing he knows. It's the only thing he's ever seen. So he believes that 
The shadow on the wall of the bird is the bird. Now Plato says, imagine for a moment that he breaks out of his chains and stands up and turns around. What he will immediately see, two things. He's going to see a bright light that's going to hurt his eyes because he's been in the darkness for his whole life. So that's, that's number one. The flame is going to be very bright. But the second thing that he will see once his eyes adjust is that the object that is the true object that's casting the shadow is the real thing. So the shadow on the wall is not the real object. It's the thing that's being held up in front of the flame that's the real object. Then Plato said, now imagine this. Now imagine this guy starts following the cave passages and actually manages to get outside. Two things are going to happen. Number one, the sun is going to be blinding to him. He's never seen the sun before. He's never seen daylight. It's going to hurt his eyes. But once his eyes adjust, he will begin to see birds in the sky, birds in the trees. And he will realize, oh my goodness, not only is the shadow on the wall not the real thing, but the thing on the stick being held up in front of the flame is not the real thing. This is the real thing. Plato says, this is the theory of forms, that everything in the world that we see is but a shadow of the true and the real. Okay? This is just his theory that he came up with. And this is the story that he told. But here's what's interesting. Jesus came along 400 years later and said something very, very similar. He talked about this thing called the kingdom of heaven. We've, we've heard about it. We just sang songs about it. The kingdom of the heavens is now advancing, right? The kingdom of heaven is it's the single biggest thing that Jesus talked about during his ministry. He told parable after parable after parable about what the kingdom of heaven is like. It's like buried treasure. And if you find it, you sell everything you have to get the field that the treasure's in. Or it's like a seed being sown out and some of the seed is landing on good grass and some of it's landing on concrete and some of it's landing where thorns are. Or the kingdom of the heaven is like a fishnet that's being thrown out. The, parable after parable after parable. For Jesus, the kingdom of heaven is what he would say is the really real. It is reality. It is all around us. He said this several times. It's all around us. It's before us, behind us, above us, below us. It is even within us. You almost get this idea that the kingdom of heaven for Jesus is like a fish swimming in a fishbowl and the water is the kingdom of heaven. And this fish is swimming in the kingdom of heaven and breathing the kingdom of heaven in and out. So it's inside of the fish. It's outside of the fish. It's everywhere. This is the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus said, this is the really, real, real thing. Now, he never specifically said like Plato, what you are seeing is a, but a shadow, but it's kind of implied in what he's saying. And so the very first thing we read in the Gospel of John, in fact, we're going to look at it next week, uh, once John is arrested and Jesus begins his public ministry, the very first thing that he preaches which he calls the good news or the gospel. This is the gospel according to Jesus. He says, expand your mind because the kingdom of heaven is closer than you realize. It's right at your fingertips. It's within your grasp. In fact, it's within you. Change the way you think about everything because the kingdom of heaven is right here, right now. And he said, it's possible to see it in this life. In fact... It's a shame that we started this passage on verse 2 today because verse 1, right before this, this is what he says to the disciples. He's got all of his disciples standing around him. And he says, I assure you that some standing here won't die before they see the kingdom of heaven arrive in power. Now we have wrestled with that verse for a long time because we don't know how to define the kingdom of heaven. If we define the kingdom of heaven... Uh, as a place that you go to when you die, well, then that statement doesn't make any sense. Some of you here will not die before you seek the kingdom of heaven. Well, it's the place you go to when you die, so how do you, how's that going to work? So that, that's problematic. Or some people say, well, the kingdom of heaven is reality that will be ushered in when Jesus returns. Jesus ascended into heaven, and when Jesus comes back, the kingdom of heaven will be everywhere and will be known. And so... That's what he's talking about. The problem is all of those disciples died. So that's a hard, hard 
verse to translate. Some of you here will not die until you see the kingdom of heaven come in power and Jesus hasn't returned yet and they're all dead. Other people say that the kingdom of heaven is what Jesus meant when he ascended into heaven to sit at the right hand of the Father uh, you know, until all the enemies are put under his, his uh, feet. And so the kingdom of heaven is, is just a, a, a state of things that we can't see, um, but we believe that it's true, that Jesus is somewhere else at the right hand of the Father. But Jesus said, some of you will see it. You will not die before you see it. So all of these translations have problems. All these interpretations of this verse have problems unless we look at it the way that I want to look at it. I might be wrong here. I could be wrong. But I, I, I think this is what Jesus is talking about. I think when Jesus takes Peter and James and John up onto the mountainside, what he is doing is keeping his promise. He just told them, some of you here will not die before you see this thing. Peter, James, and John, come with me. Let's go. And what happens when they're up on the mountain? They catch a glimpse of something that is hard to describe, but I think what they were seeing is reality as it really is. They're no longer seeing the shadows on the wall. They're not even seeing objects on a stick in front of a flame. They're seeing the really real. They're seeing Jesus as he really is up on that mountaintop. We call this Transfiguration Sunday. We call that, we say that because what we mean is that Jesus was changed, transfigured, changed form, that Jesus changed form in front of their eyes. But I wonder if this should be called Transvision Sunday because Peter, James, and John, their perception, if what I'm saying is correct, their perception of things changed. Now, all of a sudden, Jesus doesn't look like an ordinary rabbi standing there. They see Jesus. Oh, my gosh. They see Jesus as he really is. They see Elijah and Moses, who have been dead or gone for a long, long time. Normally, Moses and Elijah are not there. All of a sudden, something flips. They see Moses and Elijah standing there as well. Transvisioned Sunday. If you've ever read uh, or heard uh, near-death experiences, people giving an account of a near-death experience, I think there was a couple books maybe written recently, Heaven is for Real or 90 Minutes in Heaven. There's different accounts, right? But all of them have similar descriptions. They all say something like bright lights. They all say something like uh, hearing voices. They all say that they encounter uh, loved ones who have been dead for a long time, kind of welcoming. It sounds very, very similar to what the, the Mark is trying to describe in this account here. Bright lights, uh, voices coming from heaven, this is my son, seeing dead people, right? And I always kind of shrug these accounts off as, well, that's just the hallucination of a, of a dying brain, really, is what that is. But now I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure anymore. In fact, I'm pretty convinced that Jesus' prime message, what he called the good news or the gospel, was that this unseen realm was closer than we could imagine. We just can't see it. But if you sought it, if you seek ye first the kingdom and his righteousness, then everything that you need will be given unto you. That this realm that can't be seen normally, if you seek it, you could find it in this lifetime. You'll definitely find it in the next lifetime, right? Which is why the near-death experience, I think, gives way to this. It's why it's such a common description that people give. But for Jesus, the kingdom of heaven wasn't a place that you go to when you die uh, it, it wasn't about some uh, future reign in which, um, you know, things are made different visibly. I think he was talking about a reality that is here right now that we can participate in if we believe him, right? First thing you got to do is go, I don't think he's crazy. Even though I don't see what he's talking about, 
I don't think he's crazy. I think there, there really is something here. And occasionally you encounter these places. We call them thin spaces, thin places where, where heaven and earth feel like they're almost touching, like you can reach through and grab something, like it's right there. But this is a really hard idea to swallow. And if you try to talk about this to people, they're probably going to think you're nuts, which makes sense then why Jesus would say to the disciples coming down from the mountain, by the way, don't tell anybody about this. Why, Jesus? That was all. Don't tell anybody about this. Wait, just wait a little bit. Wait, wait until after Easter. <laughs> then you can start talking about it, right? Because Jesus knows what they just saw, what they just encountered, what they just became aware of is so fantastical that, that nobody's ever going to believe that. And yet this is the prime message that Jesus gave. And so I can't help but wonder, what if we could believe this? What if we could experience it? What if you could catch a glimpse of something like what the disciples saw that day on this mountaintop? Would it change your view of the world? Would it change your view of your neighbor? Would it change your view about the afterlife? Would it change your view on your current suffering and pain and problems? You bet it would. It would change everything. It would change everything. You see, when Jesus would say these strange things like somebody would be getting a glass of water and he would say, you know, I could give you living water because that water, you're going to be thirsty again. But I have some living water I can give you. You'll never thirst again. Or when somebody was eating some bread and he would say, you know that bread, you feel good right now, but you're going to be hungry in about 30 minutes. But I have some bread that I could give you that you would never be hungry again. Or he would say things like, you know, there's life and then there's abundant life or eternal life. And I can give you that if you want. I think this is what he's talking about. I think this is the message he's trying to convey. That we look around. That we see things and we think we see, know what we're seeing. And Jesus says, you know, there's something more. There's something more behind the curtain. And if you could catch a glimpse of it, you'll never worry about anything ever again. So if it's true, how do we see it? How do we see it? Well, Jesus gave us some clues. He would say things like, if you want to enter the kingdom, you must become like a little child. Or he told Nicodemus, if you want to enter the kingdom, you must be born again. Right? Two, two ways of saying something to the effect of, uh, your grown-up thinking, you, you, you think you've got it all together, you've got to do away with all of that. You've got to get to some kind of place where you've got to let go and dwell in innocence when it comes to our perception, right? I, I know, I, I can tell you what reality is. I look at it, I see it all day long, and Jesus says, throw all that away. Throw all that away. You've got to become like a little child. That's one thing he says. He also said this. He said, you must deny yourselves, take up your own cross, and follow me. Now, I don't like that statement very much. I, I can guess what it probably means. It probably means death of self, some type of dropping of my defenses, uh, following Jesus into scary and dark places. That, that's probably what it means. You have to be willing to let something go in order to see this unseen thing. Now, seasoned followers of Jesus will tell you there is no step-by-step -step practice that if you do steps one, two, and three, voila, you will see it. They will tell you there is no, there is no rhyme or reason, right? Uh, Paul, the Apostle Paul, before he was Paul and he was Saul and he was persecuting the church, He's, he's on his way to persecute the church, and bam, Jesus hits him, right? There was no rhyme or reason to that. Uh, Stephen, I think about Stephen, as they're throwing stones at him, they're stoning him, the first martyr of the church, 
he looks up and he sees the heavens part. He says, I see Jesus sitting at the right hand of the Father. I see it. I see it. They go, you're nuts. There's nothing there. And they keep throwing rocks at him. I see it. I see it. And it just completely gave him the ability to die with peace. And he did. First martyr of the church. There is no rhyme or reason. There is no right way to do it. But next week, we will look at some signposts along the path to this unseen realm, what some people call the wayless way. Think about that statement for a second. The wayless way. The way to see it is without a way, which sounds counterintuitive, backwards. But we'll look at some signposts about what some people have said, this is how I saw it. This is how I encountered it. This is how I broke through that, that, that veil and saw the unseen things. But I got to tell you, uh, today's uh, sermon is called Crossing Over because we are crossing over from uh, the season after Christmas and, and, you know, Epiphany into a new season called Lent. And Lent is all about preparation for Easter. Now, what is Easter if not seeing unseen things? When you encounter the living Christ, as they did on that third day, you are seeing things that you should not be seeing, right? And so we we understand we too want to see the living Christ. We want to encounter Christ. We we don't want to just talk about it. We want to do more. We, We want to be changed from the inside out. We want to have an encounter with Jesus that changes us. Lent is that process by which we maybe let some stuff go, okay? And so this is going to be a good time for us to ponder what may need to change, to maybe give some things up, to maybe think about what does it mean to become like a little child? How, how am I too grown up for God and I need to become a little bit more innocent in my thinking? And then perhaps... If we follow this wayless way, when Easter arrives, we too might see something different this year. We might catch a glimpse of something that you can't really talk about because people will think you're nuts. I guess that's what I'm saying. We want to we have some experience where we go, I, I've seen something, but I can't really talk about it. You know, Wouldn't that be awesome this year? If Jesus showed up, I mean, Jesus is here right now, but... Like if all of a sudden visible, we were seeing Jesus or hearing from Jesus in a way that we went, we can't can't talk about this outside of here because people might think we're a little crazy. I think that that place will be something like Plato described where the light of it is probably blinding to our eyes because we haven't encountered anything like this before. There may be maybe some, some voices some hearing of something from the heavenly realms that we can't describe or we, we don't know what to do with it. There may be some, some idea that, that our loved ones who have gone on before are also in this place which is right here, somehow, some way. I think all of that could be a possibility. And so I want to I wanna take Lent and I, and I want to pursue that. And I'm going to ask you to join me in that because I think Jesus is trying to tell us something. And I think that it's really real. And I think for those who seek, Jesus would not tell us to seek it if it couldn't be found. And so I want to seek it during Lent. I want to ask you to join me. And we may come out on the other side of Lent and nothing has changed, and that's okay too because we still believe Jesus. But isn't it worth pursuing Looking, thinking, changing, letting go. Folks, may we be awakened to this marvelous mystery that Jesus calls the kingdom of God. May we encounter it. May it change us. May we be a different people so that we can love better, serve better, worship better. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.
Will you grab the hand of the person next to you? And receive this blessing as you go this week, as you go tonight to watch the big game and eat the chicken wings and watch the commercials. And then as you move into your week, as you think about the possibility that there is a greater reality that we are swimming in and breathing in, and that you might catch a glimpse of it this week. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. May you know that in this reality you are perfectly loved, completely forgiven, uniquely empowered, Now you're called to go out into the world and proclaim this same good news. The kingdom of heaven is among you. Wake up. Expand your mind. Look for it. As you try to do that, you're going to forget this week because we all do. We get wrapped up in our own stuff. We forget this message that Jesus preached. We start to see things as shadows and we think that they're real. But even when we make mistakes, even when we fail, God does not change his view of us. He still looks at us and says, y'all, if you could only see, you are the best of the best of the best. And knowing that and believing that and living like that will change everything. So take that good word in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and go from this place in peace. Amen.